A good data model or semantic model is key for a well-performing Power BI report. So therefore, I put together 10 steps that you can take to optimize your model. And we're going to cover them in just 10 minutes. So let's dive in. Step number one, get rid of columns and tables that you are not using. So let's say you have a report that just shows the sales by state and the development over time. Well, then many of the tables and columns that I have in this big data model here, we could get rid of. Now, how can you find these unused tables and columns? Well, for that, there are many different external tools like Bravo. You see, it shows that I'm not using 105 columns out of 131 columns. So that is a huge amount of space that I could save in my model. Or we could use Power BI Helper which also gives a nice little overview of the used and unused tables and columns. Then step number two, well, you also want to get rid of all of the rows that you don't need. Or let me rephrase that a little bit better. Aggregate the data to the level of detail that you need for the visualizations that show on your report. So let's say I have just these two visuals, sales by state and development over time. Well, then I could also aggregate the data to that level of detail. So that means in my sales table, I would not need all of the details for every single order line, which in my case would lead to 222,123 rows. But instead, we could aggregate the sales amount by the state and year month. And that would just lead to 1,794 rows, a huge difference. And it would still allow me to build the exact same visualizations. As you can see here for the top visuals, I've taken the data from the FCT sales table. And for the bottom visuals, I've taken the data from the aggregated sales table and they look exactly the same. Now, of course, the downside is that I take some analytical power away, meaning if I wanted to drill through to a table where I show the orders, well, that is of course not possible with the aggregated sales table. Now, if you're wondering how can you create that aggregated sales table? Well, for that, you can go to Power Query and there you can make use of the group by transformation, where you can then set up the group by fields as well as the aggregation fields. Then step three is to make sure that auto date and time is turned off. Now, what does that mean? Well, if you go to settings, then under data load, there is a checkbox auto date and time. If it's turned on, then it automatically creates hidden date tables for each field in the model that has a date or date time data type. Now, let me turn it on so that you can see what will happen. Now, for each date column, we have a hidden date table with the standard calendar hierarchy. Now, in Power BI, you can see that from this little icon there, where we can now click on expand, and you see we have a whole date hierarchy. But if we use an external tool like DAX Studio, then here we can actually see those hidden date tables that have the year, the quarter, the month, and the sorting columns. And if I would go here to advance and view the metrics, then it's visible that those date tables also take quite a lot of space. So make sure that auto date and time is turned off and that you build your own custom date table like I've done over here, which also gives you more flexibility in terms of what descriptive information you need about the dates, like fiscal year, quarter, and month. Then step number four, go for a star schema instead of a snowflake or flat table. Now, let's say you have a flat table, which is something that a lot of Excel users have at the beginning when they start with Power BI. Now, the first downside is that it's kind of difficult to navigate, especially if you have many columns. Now, compare this to a model where everything is nicely organized in different dimensions and fact tables. For example, if I need descriptive information about the employees, I would simply go here to dim employee and I have all of the descriptive attributes for the employees. Now, another downside of having everything in a flat table is that a lot of the data in the table is repeated and therefore the model is going to be bigger and the file itself as well. As you can see over here, the flat table file is 34 MBs and the other one is just six and a half MBs. Now, on top of that, your DAX calculations will also be much easier to write if you have a star schema. And why not a snowflake schema where you go for a higher form of normalization? For example, for a customer table, we could take out the descriptive information for each city and create a separate table where we have just one line with the descriptive information for each city. And then again, we could do the same thing for the states. The thing is, if we go for a higher form of normalization in Power BI, it has a negative impact on the performance because more joins need to happen in the queries. Now, another downside is the usability to navigate the data model. Now already I have two exit tables and it could be if I normalize all of the other dimension tables as well, that I would end up with 20, 30 tables and at some point it's just too much. And it would be actually easier to have just one table for all of the customer related data. Then step number five, remove any one-to-one -one relationships. You don't need them. They just slow down your model. Instead of that, merge the information of the two tables into one table. 
Like over here, I have one table for all of the customer details, and then a separate table with information about the credit limits, which might be data that comes from a different source. Now, the two could be connected with a one-to-one -one relationship on customer ID. But instead of this, it's better to just merge the two tables into one table so that that extra relationship is not necessary because that would just slow things down. Now, how could you do that? Well, in Power Query, you could just go to Merge Queries and then merge the customer table with the credit limit table on the customer ID. And then click on OK, do a left join. And then you get a column that contains all of the nested tables with the match rows, which you can then expand. And then you can choose which columns you want to bring over, credit limit and is on credit hold, and click OK. And that's it. Then step number six, stay away as much as possible from bi-directional and many-to-many -many relationships. Now, for example, bi-directional filters are often used by beginner Power BI users because they want the filter from one dimension to flow to the other dimension, because otherwise you get the following experience. You might in your report have two slicers, one for the customers, one for the products. And then when you make a selection in both, let's say here we have a customer selected and here a product, you could end up with nothing. And that is a little bit confusing because now you have to start to guess, well, what products did that customer buy? Now, instead of that, you could use bidirectional filtering, right? So that the filter goes from your customer table to the products table by just making that relationship in between FCD sales and stock item in this case, bidirectional. Now, if I would go back to the report, you see now we have only those products that that customer bought. Now, this works. However, it can be incredibly slow, especially if you have fields with a high cardinality, so a lot of unique items. Now, the second downside of bidirectional filtering is that it could introduce some ambiguity meaning you could end up with wrong values in your report. Now, how could this happen? Now, over here, we have two fact tables, which is when the ambiguity could happen. If we have a filter that goes from dim date to FCT purchases, that filter could go from dim date directly to FCT purchases, or could go through FCT sales, and then from FCT sales to dim stock item, and then from this table to FCT purchases. And that well, could lead to different values. Then step number seven is to reduce the cardinality of the columns that are in your model. Meaning the less unique values you have for each column, the better the compression and the more optimized your data model will be. Now, a common example are date time columns where there are always a lot of unique values because, well, the same date and time don't repeat many times. So here you see I have one column called last edited with both the date as well as the time component. And right next to it, I split it into two columns, a date column and a time column. Now, let's go to Deck Studio to see what impact that has. Now, first of all, you see that the last edited column is one of the biggest columns inside of that table. And right next to it, we have last edited time and date, which are way smaller than the last edited column. And right next to it, we have the last edited time and date, which when combined are still much smaller in size than just that last edited column, because the cardinality of these two columns is much lower. And the cardinality you can see over here, here we have 78,959 unique values, and here we have 920 unique values. Whereas in the last edited column, there we have 221,747 unique items. A huge difference. Now let's go to step number eight, which is to make sure that the correct data type is assigned to each field. Because some data types, they take more space than others. For example, a text data type takes more space than an integer whole number data type. Now let's take the customer ID from the customer table, which has the data type whole number but let's compare that to a custom ID column that has a data type text. So over here, I have exactly the same column, but here we're going to assign a data type text. Let's then open up Dex Studio, where we can then look at the metrics. So here in the customer table, there we have the custom ID text column, which is taking the most space. And where's the custom ID column? Well, let me scroll down, which is all the way here. So you see the total size of that column as a whole number is much smaller than when we have it as text. Then optimization step number nine, use calculated columns and tables in moderation. For example, when we calculate total sales, we could add a new column and then multiply the quantity times the unit price, which gives us the total sales row by row. And that column we can then sum up. Or 
Alternatively, you can also go for a measure. Now that measure would look like this, where we have an iterator function, some x, which goes row by row over the sales table, multiplies quantity times the price, and then of those values takes the sum. Now, what is the big difference? Well, a measure doesn't take any space in your model. The column does it. It needs to store all of the values in that calculated column. And the measure doesn't take any space. Now, what is important to know, though, is that that measure could take a little bit longer to calculate versus a simple sum of a column. So it is a little bit of a trade-off. So when you have a measure that takes very long time to compute and therefore creates a bad experience for the end user, well, then you might want to consider a calculated column. However, if that's not the case, then you should prefer the measure. And if we go for a column, should you do it here with DAX or should you do it in Power Query or maybe even further upstream? Now, generally, people always recommend push it as far upstream as possible. One reason is that the compression is a little bit better than so a smaller data model. However, that is very minimal and only really noticeable if you have very big data models. Second, if you have incremental refresh set up on that table, well, then all of the other partitions also need to be recalculated if you have a calculated column. So in those cases, calculated columns are also not ideal. However, sometimes you might have calculations that are really complex to do in Power Query, well, then you might still want to consider going for a calculated column. Or if you are just developing quickly and later on want to push it further upstream, then of course doing it with calculated columns can be a little bit quicker than doing it in Power Query or even further upstream. And then the last one, step number 10, is to consider if you go for import mode of your tables or direct query mode. Now, direct query would not import the data and leave the data where it is, which might be a good option if you have very big data sets and it would just be too much to import. So thinking maybe over 100 million of rows, or you really need the latest numbers. The data needs to be super fresh because with direct query, it fetches the data when you interact with the report. With import mode, there you need to set up refreshes. And if two or three refreshes a day are not enough for you, then maybe direct query is a better option. However, the big downside of direct query is that it can be much slower than import mode. So ideally, always go for import mode unless you really need direct query. So here you see I have my sales table two times. This one over here is import mode. So in the properties, you can see the storage mode is set to import. Now I cannot change it because, well, the source is an Excel file and an Excel file only supports import mode. However, here I have also the sales table with the import mode direct query. Now here I can change it because, well, the source is an SQL database. Okay, so one is in direct query, the other one is in import mode. Now, if I go to the report view, I've created two times the same visual. First one at the top gets the data from the table ST sales. The second one here at the bottom gets the data from ST sales direct query. Now, if we look at the optimization pane and start recording and then click here on refresh visuals, you will see that the second one takes much longer to load because that is the direct query one that needs to fetch the data from the SQL database. So these are my 10 steps to optimize any Power BI data model. Now let me know if you have more optimization steps, put them in the comment section below. And if you want to watch more Power BI videos, then check out these two over here. Now, if you want to build reports together with me and learn all of my best practices, tips, and tricks, then check out my upcoming design training over here. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video.